Amen. Thank you, Wanda, for playing for us, uh, for the piano. Thank you, James, for leading the service. Thank you, Judah, and for doing the sound booth. Appreciate each person's ministry. I appreciate Pastor Lapino helping me uh, for this morning. We had we usually do an introduction into our Sunday school uh, time, and I'm like, okay, I, I need uh, need somebody to help me, and, and he graciously uh, uh, said that he could help me with that, and so I praise the Lord for, for him uh, doing that for me. So if you have your Bibles close at hand, we're going to be reading Psalm 39. Psalm 39. <clears throat> I'm going to keep my water next to me, so if I need it. All right. Psalm 39, and if you're able to stand, please stand for a reading of God's Word. Psalm 39, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 3. All right. Good to see each one of you here today. I'm really excited about the uh, upcoming sermon series that we're going to be looking into. And so, Psalm 39, verse number 1 through 3. I said, I will take heed to my ways, that I sin not with my tongue, I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. I was dumb with silence. I held my peace even from good, and my sorrow was stirred. My heart was hot within me while I was musing. The fire burned. Then spake I with my tongue. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on our message this morning. Father, we thank you so much for how wonderful you are how gracious You are to us, how loving You are, that while we did not know You, You loved us. Before we can love You, You have loved us from all eternity, past to eternity, future. And Father, we thank You so much for the ability to speak. May You help me as I speak and help all of our hearts to be open to what the Word says, to help us to know You better, help us to trust You more, Help us to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength so that we can also love one another as Christ loved us. And Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask you to help us to know you better from this time. I do pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> so the new sermon series that I'm starting on today is specifically this thing of taming the tongue to help us all with communicating with one another. Uh, it's kind of an interesting thing. I think that one of the greatest miracles is the very fact that we can actually communicate with one another. Just think about how amazing that is. Right now, I have in my mind everything that I want to say and want to communicate, and it's <laughs> if you know my mind is kind of like all over the place. Like I get distracted very, very easily. Like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing something, I'm working hard at something, then all of a sudden something else, oh, I got to do this over here. And then, so I forget everything that I've been doing. I'm like, oh, what is this over here? Oh, something shiny, yeah. Uh, one of those things about my mind, I am right now trying to figure out how I can communicate best with the crowd in front of me and specifically, what's coming out of my mouth sometimes does not, um, does not correlate with what's going up here. Like, for instance, if a uh, pastor is speaking on uh, Joshua and he keeps on calling him Joseph, afterwards, a person's going to come up and say, you know, you, you said the wrong name all throughout your sermon. Well, what's up here is not necessarily coming out of the mouth. So it's a marvelous thing, this thing of communication. Then not only that, it's I'm the giver and you are the receiver. What happens is my mind is trying to communicate out my mouth and right now it's going through the airwaves to hitting your ear, getting translated into your mind and different thoughts are going into your mind as I'm going about this. Sometimes when I do this, I could tell when people are with me and when people are not. And it's a funny thing to, to see, like, oh, this person's not with me anymore. He's thinking of lunch right now. Uh, or he's thinking about, you know, this or that and the other. It's like, okay. But it's such an interesting thing that communication is two-way, usually. And when we communicate with each other, sometimes we communicate in a way 
Well, it's detrimental to our relationships. Sometimes we communicate in such a way that we hurt other people's feelings. Sometimes we're not even aware of how we come across. Sometimes we don't have that, that wonderful gift of, of hindsight or really knowing how we're coming across to another person. I know we all have blind sides. I know we all have, uh, have room to grow in the grace of God. And so, but we praise the Lord that we have the ability to look into His Word and see what God's Word has to say about this thing about communication. And just amazing, it says quite a lot. But today, we're, what we're looking at in Psalm 39, specifically, before we get to the doing, we have to get down to the motives. Before we can say, okay, we need to stop saying this, or we need to stop doing this, or, or no matter what, we have to get down to what is the heart of the issue. So we're looking at specifically the heart before we speak. And so here, what we're going to see is that we're going to see specifically three ideas to start us off with in Psalm 39. And the first one that you can see in the very first verse is specifically, and it's very, very just ground level, it is easy to sin with our mouths. Isn't that right? Verse number one, I said I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. Think about how many different ways it could be that we can sin with our just by speaking. We can lie. Like Ananias and Sapphira, they came, Peter asked them a simple question, is this all that you sold your property for? And they said, yes. And they were killed on the spot because of their lying to the Holy Spirit. Lying is a huge deal. In fact, in the book of Proverbs where it talks about there are seven abominations to the Lord, two specifically are about lying. One is the actual lying tongue, and the second one is the uh, liar, the person that does cause is a false witness. So God is really, uh, he really points out the very fact that lying is absolutely wrong. In fact, he is truth and everything else uh, is a lie. He is truth, and then when we lie, we, we sin against the truth, who He is. And so there's a lot of ways we can sin with our tongue. Another way you can sin with your tongue, we see in Old Testament Israel, is that of complaining. Yeah, I don't know how many of you can relate to that, but Old Testament, like in the wilderness wanderings, it's just an amazing thing. The Israelites get from from that of being in slavery. Now they are given their freedom. They are exiting out of Egypt. The Red Sea is parted. They're going on on dry ground. They get to the other side. They see Pharaoh and his army wiped out. They praise God that moment. And the next, oh, God just brought us out here to kill us because we have no water. Wow, how quickly that changed. <laughs> how quickly that changed from you're praising God one moment, but the next you're complaining about God doesn't have your best interests at hand. Yeah, where, the, where is there not enough graves in Egypt that we had to be brought out here for God to kill us now? And so, yeah, all throughout that part of the Old Testament, it makes me chuckle, uh, but God, you see the graciousness of God through the first part. Then they get the Sinai, they get the law, they get the rules, they get God's word. And then from that point forward, every time they did complain, God judged them. God judged them. God judged them. Imagine with me, every time that you complained, God judged you. I don't think any of us would be here, <laughs> to be quite honest. I know myself, I'm like, uh, I, I would be dead a long time ago. But yeah, we complain, we lie, we we, well, here's another one of that of, uh, of gossip. You know, that's a hard one. Uh, how about uh, specifically being, um, I want to say, destructively critical. And the reason why I say that, destructively critical, is that there is, um, uh, there is constructive criticism. That is good. That is us trying to be better from what we were. It's like you come to me and say, hey, I got this, this thought a constructive criticism is like, okay, wonderful. I'm, I'm glad to hear you. I'm really interested in, in getting better. And so you can come in with any constructive criticism you have. Uh, 
I get a line after this service. <laughs> All these different ways that uh, I could be better. But okay. But constructive criticism is one thing. Destructive criticism is another thing entirely. Yeah, with the Word, it's, it's an amazing thing. The Word is such a small instrument, but yet great are the, uh, the effects of it. In the book of James, chapter number 3, it talks about that the, the tongue is such a small thing, it's like a little fire that can engulf the greatest of, of force. So for us, we need to remind ourselves, yes, it is quite easy for us to know that we can sin with our mouths. We can lie, we can uh, complain, we can gossip, we can um, uh, destructively criticize, uh, we can boast in ourselves. That happens. And so we can, there's a lot of ways for us. It's easy to sin with our mouths. Second thing we're going to notice here in Psalm 39 is that our thoughts becomes the words that we speak. Our thoughts become the words that we speak. Notice with me what it says here in verse number two. So, okay, let's start in verse one, actually. I said I will, not, I will take heed to my, my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. I was dumb with silence. I held my peace even from good and my sorrow was stirred. My heart was hot within me while I was musing. The fire burned. Then spake I with my tongue. So notice with me. He says, while I was, word is musing. The word muse has to deal with what we think about on a consistent basis. What are our thought processes as we go along in our day? It's whatever becomes what we think about is usually what comes out of our mouths. And we see that um, in many different ways. Now here, David, he's going to be, he, he's, he wants to not sin with his tongue. He wants to keep his mouth with a bridle. He wants to take guard of his mouth and what he says. He, he says that he even withheld the good, not just the bad, but the good from people. And so his heart stirred within him. He's thinking about these things. He's concentrating. And then all of a sudden, he just lets it out. It's like a, a volcano. It's like, it might seem like everything's calm on top. But underneath, there are things going on that we don't know about. And eventually, at times, it erupts. And just like that, a lot of the times that we get in trouble with our conversations is because we've been thinking about this so much. It's, getting, it's festering upon you. It's, oh, I can't believe this person did this to me. I can't believe this person didn't think through what, what they did. Oh, I can't believe. Oh. And then eventually... Hey, uh, could you do this? Ha, ah, you! <laughs> and then we scold that person and we, we say, how dare you ask that of me? I don't, you don't know how much you hurt me. So what we think comes out. And a lot of times, if it's the wrong thing we're thinking about, it's the wrong thing that comes out. So notice with me, number three, not just that. Number three, the musing of our hearts affect our emotions our attitudes when we speak. Notice with me what it says. Verse 2, I was dumb with silence. I held my peace even from good and my star sorrow was stirred. What do you think David's feeling at this point? He's getting more and more upset. His sorrow is, he's seen the wickedness of people and he just can't, can't let it go. And here, my heart was hot within me while I was musing the fire burned. Then spake I with my tongue. <clears throat> it's an amazing thing to think about. What do we muse about? What is our underlying thoughts throughout the day? If it's thoughts of good rather than evil, that's great. It needs to be and ought to be that. But yet we need to remind ourselves throughout this time that what we think about really does affect the emotions. As what the Bible says, the, the, as a man thinketh, so is he. And a lot of times, if we worry about things, guess what? It affects our emotions. 
It's just an amazing thing to think about. Your mind affects your body entirely. And so we ought to think about what do we think about on a regular basis. The Bible has a lot to say about the heart itself, the musing of the heart. Uh, so we just saw, uh, we just heard, for as a man thinketh so in his heart, so is he. Uh, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. O generation of vipers, Jesus is referring to the Pharisees here. How can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if we're, the last but not least, oh, a good man out of a good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. So we see a lot about our hearts. See, <clears throat> if we just try to uh, nurse our way of communication, we're not doing a good job of changing the root of the communication. So first we got to start with the heart, and then we can change then the communication as we go along. So what the Bible says about the heart it will help us in understanding how we can better communicate. David here in Psalm 39, he has said that his heart stirred in him and actually he actually didn't say anything to anybody else that was there, but rather he spoke to God. He prayed. If, if you look on with, with me in, in this verse, <clears throat> verse number 3, My heart was hot within me while I was musing, the fire burned, then spake I, with my tongue. Lord, make me to know mine end at the measure of my days, what it is, that I may know how frail I am. So just an amazing thing. His heart, what was in his heart, musing, stirring, emotionally, he's wanting to speak, but he's not going to speak to the men that are there that are causing the problem. He's going to talk to God. I love the fact that David is a man after God's own heart. And so with that in mind, to, to, we need to diagnose our own hearts as we think about this thing of communication. We need to test our own hearts to see whether or not we are right with God and how we're actually communicating with other people. So there are four questions that, I, that we're going to ask ourselves. And then from there, we're going to go to our... Uh, our prayer time, about what God is dealing with us with uh, regarding our own hearts. So how do we test our own hearts? It's like a person going into the doctors. He's going to ask you some questions. All right, how are you feeling? And if you're honest and you're not feeling that good, then they go through the line of, okay, it could be this, it could be that. For us, it's a, a bit simpler. For us, we go through these questions and we have to be introspective as to how our condition of our heart is right now. If it is right with God, then that's great. But a lot of times we can get so caught up in our days that we don't realize the effect that our hearts have on what we're doing. So the first question that I want to ask, number one, is are our hearts new or old? Are our hearts new or old? You might say that is a very odd question to ask. What are you asking me? Did I have a heart transplant recently? Uh, <laughs> in fact, I read the other day that they did some sort of me medical experiment as to, okay, they're, they're, they're trying to figure out whether or not pig organs are compatible with human. So what happened was, this person, <clears throat> excuse me, this might be a shorter sermon than, than what I expected it to be. <clears throat> Sorry. So what happened was that they had this idea, okay, we can transplant a pig's heart into a human and they can survive. And so they had a willing applicable, a, 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 a person that applies. Okay. <laughs> Boy, it's not coming out right. This up here is not coming out there. So uh, we had a person that applied for the, the whole experiment. And so they did it. They opened up his chest, took out the human heart, put in the pig heart, 
closed them back up, and they stood back and said, okay, let's see how long he lasts. And he lasted, I believe it was three weeks. Um, but just to think about it, if I'm going to go through all the trouble of having a heart transplant, it's not going to be from a pig. I'm sorry, that creature is not going to be able to, to pump my uh, blood sufficiently enough for me to survive. And to go through open heart surgery and only last three more weeks, forget it. <laughs> I'd, rather be, I'd rather go home with, to be with the Lord, which is far better. But yeah, are our hearts new or old? So what am I asking here? I'm asking you whether or not you have put your faith in Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. Why is that important? That's this beginning part, part of anything that we go through. If we want to make our lives better, the Bible way, it begins with this thing called salvation. Salvation is free for anybody that receives it. It's free for you. You don't have to do anything in order to earn it. In fact, you can't do anything to earn it. I heard a survey was done in Great Britain recently, and they asked the question, uh, about life after death. And majority of the people say, said that hopefully there is life after death. Then when the question was asked, what does it take in order to get to that place? What, how, what does it take to get to heaven? 82% said is, you got to be a good person. You've got to work it all out yourself. 82% of the population in Great Britain and they went down the line, and it was a very small percentage about actually what it actually takes for people to go to heaven. Here it is. You can't be a good person because we're all born as sinners into this world. We're born with an animosity towards God. You might think, well, I'm not that bad. Well, any sin that we do is against an infinite and holy God who is perfect in everything He does who is loving, who is holy, and who is just. Looking at the world, we see a lot of injustices in the world today. But God is absolutely just. The only way we could say, well, there's injustice, is that we have to have one that is absolutely just. And that's God. God loved us knowing that we're sinners, knowing that we are not in right relationship with Him. He provided the only way for us to get right which is Jesus Christ. God in the flesh. The Son became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus said Himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by Me. Just an amazing thing to say. Yeah, Jesus is the only way. A lot of people want to say, no, 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 no. There must be other routes. You go with Buddhism, you go with Hinduism, you go with you know, Judaism, you go with uh, anything else. It all leads to the same place, right? They're all basically the same. No, they're not. Jesus is the only person in the history of the world that says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And then did something about it that we could never do ourselves. He died on the cross for all of our sins. He became sin for us who knew no sin, so that when He died, He died for each and every one of us in our place. And, and then He rose again the third day, proving who He claimed to be. The Messiah, the Son of God and God the Son. The Word made flesh. And because of that, we can have full confidence in what the Bible says, that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. That Jesus Christ, by putting our faith in Him and what He has done for us, He can give us the gift of eternal life to be with Him for all eternity. Forgiveness of sins. What an amazing thing that is. And with that, a new heart. Not the, the stony heart that we once had, but rather a heart of flesh. He promised this in Ezekiel. Uh, he says, I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of the, their flesh and, and will give them a heart of flesh. I know this is talking about future Israel as a whole, but in all reality, that is the same thing that has happened to us. We put our faith in Jesus Christ. He's given us a new nature in Christ. Isn't that a wonderful thing? 
Because me and my old nature, I can't do what is right, and nor do I want to do what is right. But now, I have a new nature in Jesus Christ. Now, there is a war within me. That old nature, that new nature, they're colliding constantly. And the one that I feed the most becomes the dominant in my life. So with the new nature, I have a new heart. And as long as we get closer and closer with God, as long as we draw near to God, He's going to draw near to us. As we submit to God, He helps us to have that new heart, to desire the things that He wants us to desire, to have a new heart, to want to do the right thing when God wants us to do. And so, question, are our hearts new or cold? If you have never received Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, you need to do so today. This is a very simple prayer. God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I don't deserve heaven. But Jesus died for me. And I receive Him as my own personal Savior. Forgive me of my sins. In Jesus' name, Amen. It's simple, but very profound. Have a new heart. It begins with a relationship with God through Christ. <clears throat> Second question that we have. Are our musings primarily negative or positive? Are our musings, the things that we think about on a consistent basis, are they primarily negative or positive? What do I mean by that? Okay, you're going through your day. What are you thinking about as you're going through your day? Some of us, you know, we go to work on a consistent basis. We go to work. What are your thoughts towards work? I could tell you what my thoughts were about the South Lake Hospital when I went there and uh, worked there. It's, oh, Lord, I know all these bad things are going to happen to me, and uh, I know this person's going to call out. I know this person's going to call out. Oh, I know all these bad things will happen. I know this patient's going to throw something at me. I know, I know all these things are going to happen, and oh, Lord, just... Just help me through what I'm going through. Now, most of the time, what we think about, it doesn't necessarily become reality. In fact, there's a uh, statistic out there that said only, uh, I think it was 80% of the things that we stress about, that we worry about, never happen. Now, now I'm not saying that I didn't go to work sometimes and all these call-outs happened. That it did. It's reality. Um, but the things that we're thinking about, are they negative or are they positive as a mindset? Some of us, we do a very good job as to um, worrying about things. Well, what's our thoughts like? Are they thinking, oh, how am I going to figure this out? Oh, I have this person in my life. How am I going to deal with that person? Oh, just and you're just worrying about that thing over and over because you have these negative thoughts throughout your life, throughout your time. Now, this is not to say um, I'm a fan of the uh, um, power of positive thinking. No. Uh, I do not agree with that. But specifically, thinking through biblically what we ought to be thinking about, every one of the characteristics is positive. In fact, notice with me, uh, I have the verse uh, up here. One thing I really, when I went through this part of Philippians, one thing really stuck into my mind is in verse number 8, it says what we should be thinking on. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue or if there be any praise, think on these things. You can take any one of these things. It's a very positive thing. It's positive if we're honest. It's positive if it's a good report. It's positive if it's pure. It's positive if it's just. If it's true. If it's honest. Good report. Any virtue. Any praise. They're positives. For us, and the greatest positive that we could ever be thinking about is God Almighty. It says, in everything give thanks. And it doesn't end there. For this is the will of God for us. Think about it. And everything give thanks. All right. 
I'm driving down the road, I get a flat tire. Oh, thank you, God, for this flat tire. Uh, no, <laughs> that's, you know, it's just the reality of we're thanking God because of who He is. And true, things might happen to us that we don't like. That's life. That's because we're in this sin-cursed world. And that's the reality that, that we find ourselves in. But, looking forward to the future, that if we're in Christ, this is the worst that it ever gets. We're looking forward to a better reality. We're looking forward to heaven itself. We're looking forward to a place that there is no sorrow. There is no disease. There's no, there's no uh, gray hair anymore. It's, it's perfect. There's uh, no male pattern bombs. Amen. That's wonderful. Um, think about all the realities of heaven. We can thank God. It's like, well, I got a flat tire, but praise God, I am, I know where I'm going. Uh, <laughs> I know where I'm going. I know who He is. I know He is with me. So this is okay. This is going to be fine. And uh, get, thinking through all the different ways about thinking, uh, the question is, are our thoughts primarily negative or positive? Now, I, I, don't, I don't ascribe to the theory of if you just, you just say over and over again like uh, the little, little, little train that could. Is that... I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. Yeah, there was one, there was a documentary about how schools are not, no longer um, teaching kids the basics about reading. And this one motivational speaker was called into the school and to really encourage them, now, all right, you can read, and, and this, that, and the other. And, and he's being interviewed by uh, John Stossel. He, he, he asked him the question, so... What happens when you give this talk? Um, okay, I just say, yeah, you can read, you can read, you can read. And then John stopped him. He said, but they can't. They never learned how to read. No matter how many times you could say, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. No, that doesn't, that doesn't negate the reality of doing the hard work to learn how to read. Just because the students say, I think I can read, doesn't mean they can actually read. But in all reality, we think because God has said it in His Word. Think positive thoughts. Think scriptural thoughts. Think of God Himself throughout your day. Next question, number three. What saturates our hearts? So what we have going on in our lives, that is the predominant thing that we have looking forward to. If we fill our lives with things that are ungodly, guess what? Your heart is affected. Uh, what my eye sees affects my heart. So if we just increase the garbage into our hearts, into our minds, guess what's going to come out? Garbage. For instance, if any of my kids asked me, hey, could I have uh, ice cream for lunch? Just that. Just ice cream for lunch. I would say, no, you can't. Well, why is that? Is it not a nutritious meal, that bowl of ice cream? Well, you might get the dairy, but you got a whole lot of sugar. You got a whole lot of other things going on there. That's not going to work a long time. Trust me, I know. I did that. Uh, when, I was, when I was upstairs and Laura was away with the kids at one point, I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to have ice cream for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I did. And I paid for it. You know, so it's not the way to go. Just because you're eating something doesn't make it the right thing to, to put into your body. Your body will eventually shut down. Same way with your soul. Same way. If we keep on putting in the things of the world, if we keep on putting in the, the things that we ought not to be thinking about, as the, if we're watching something and it's inputting the things that is wrong in the world today, that is contrary to God's Word, if we're doing that primarily with our lives, guess what's going to happen? It's going to affect everything about our lives, and it includes how we communicate with others. It's an amazing thing to think about that a lot of shows today the big thing is drama. 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 Because drama sells. No matter what it is, it's so dramatic. Uh, I remember this uh, 
this time where, where uh, NASCAR was trying to get more and more people to, to watch NASCAR and made things all so very dramatic of, oh, you don't know what's going to happen, seeing people flipping and, and all these different things. Oh, you don't want to miss the Daytona 500, 2025, or whatever it was. And so I'm like, wow, they really dramatized the whole thing. And guess what? That gets people more and more excited to, to watch it. But so much drama in our lives can be constituted because we watch the wrong things that we input the wrong stuff. So if we keep on putting in the wrong things, what's going to come out is specifically the wrong attitudes. It says in Hebrews chapter number 4, verse number 12, For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our of the heart. It's so important for us to put God's Word into our hearts. To saturate ourselves with the Word of God. You know, it's so convenient today with all the technology that we have. We can have God's Word on an ongoing basis being actually read to us by a little device of like a Kindle or an or a audio book or a, you know, CDs. You know. There's so many ways of listening to God's Word. If you just come here on Sunday to get something from God for the entirety of the week, you're going to be starving. <laughs> you're going to be starving all the way through the week. We have to keep on putting in God's Word into our minds, into our hearts. God's Word says that if we put our, the Word into our hearts, we might not sin against God. We'll be less likely to. We need to saturate ourselves with godliness. We need to saturate ourselves with the Word of God, with the reminders of the presence of God, with everything about God for ourselves. Last but not least, number, number four, is God a delight or is He the delight? Is he God, if God is not a delight, that's a problem. You, know, you need to get right with God. He is the one that is supreme in everything about Him. If He's not a delight in your life, then you really got to check yourself here. What's wrong between you and God? Because God is absolutely wonderful. Because God is absolutely loving. God is so marvelous in all His ways. If He's not a delight in your life, there's a major problem. You need to repent and get right with God. But yet, all of us would we probably say, no, no, God is a delight. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to hear from God's Word. It's good to be praising God with, with the, uh, the hymns, being with each other. But yet then we leave from here and then we go on to other delights that fills our souls throughout the week. Is He a delight? Or is He the delight? The Bible says specifically, delight thyself also in the Lord and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Once again, it goes back to the heart. Well, what's the desires of the heart? If we're delighting in God, then He is shaping our heart to be more like Jesus Christ. And so when the desires match up with His will, when the desires match up with His word, when the desires match up with His way, He says yes to Him. In fact, specifically, this part, the word desires, is specifically the prayers that we pray, He answers. The desires of our heart we need to delight ourselves in the Lord. You might say, well, can't we delight anything else? Or is it just God that we're delighting in and nothing, nothing else? Well, through God, you have delight in everything else. Everything else that you should be delighted in. Like, for instance, is there anything wrong with food? No, it's there because we need fuel for our bodies. God made food specifically, and God made us creative so that we can try different things with different recipes. I'm always astounded about how well my, my wife cooks and just every, 
Every time she cooks, it's just like, yeah, this is great. Whatever it is, there's only a few things that I'm like, yeah, that, that was okay. But that was just a couple of things, but the rest of it is like all throughout our marriage. Oh, wow, I forgot our, uh, our anniversary coins for the coin bank. Yeah, we celebrate our anniversary last Friday, Thursday. Thursday. Uh, so yeah, we had our 15th anniversary, so praise the Lord for that. Yeah, God is good. But yeah, all through the 15 years of marriage, she's just been so wonderfully creative with the different foods and, and everything. Is it wrong to enjoy food? No. It's wrong to enjoy food too much. If food becomes your comfort rather than God. It's wrong to have food as the, the ultimate source. Uh, you know, some people uh, uh, you know, eat to live. Uh, some people live or to eat. That ought not to be. In reality, God gives us so many different blessings that we can enjoy, enjoy immensely, but we need to enjoy it with God. Invite Him along in your joy. It's like I enjoy uh, uh, auto racing, which last week was a little disappointment with the Indy 500 and the Coca-Cola 600. Major disappointments. Uh, but reality, can I enjoy a race by enjoying God? Yes. Yes, I enjoy God while I'm watching the race. I say, God, you're so great. You have given us the ability to see something through a TV. You have given us the ability to see uh, somebody going through all these different things, all the different storylines in the race, and I enjoy God more and more through the different things. Now, I don't know what it is for you. It's probably not racing. Uh, Only a few of you have said, yeah, we enjoy racing too. But it might be you're reading a good book. Enjoy God through the good book. It might be that uh, you like quilting and you like writing short stories. You like doing all these different things. It should help us that He is our delight and through Him we delight in the things He has given us. So the question for us today to ponder when we're going to pray, and we're going to pray um, shortly. Uh, in fact, I'll ask Wanda to come to the piano uh, uh, and we're going to have a time of prayer. But the question for us today Do we delight in God's Word? Do we delight in God Himself? Are we saturated with godliness? Are we saturated with the Word of God? Primarily, how are our thoughts, our musings, are they positive? But yet, somebody here, if you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, that's your first step. So whatever it is that the Lord's been touching your heart about. Let's go before the Lord and and talk to Him about it. Let's pray. Father, we thank You so much for this time that we have before You. Deal with us according to Your will, Your way. And as we pray, may we be honest before You and dedicate ourselves to You. I do pray.